We're back with American Legacy, a television special, and the story of a man who kept going no matter what. He was ever thinking, ever planning, ever vigilant, or getting the job done. Driven, okay, intense, loving, tender, and family was very important. Power, ambition, wealth, determination, Dad, funny, smart, amazing, one of a kind, difficult. On January 19, 1993, after six short months battling a brain tumor, Reginald Francis Lewis, a noted businessman, family man, scholar, and athlete, died. Let there be a commotion. Let there be a loud noise because we are sending off a great man today. So, Dad. I love you. Goodbye. You may remember Reginald Lewis as the savvy black businessman who shared his extraordinary accomplishments in his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? I thought that myself a couple times. A few knew Lewis as husband, son, father, and friend. Through them, you will learn about the man whose brilliant mind and generous heart distinguish him as an American legacy. My father never stopped moving forward. No matter what fate threw in his way, whether that was racial, racial stereotypes that would try and hamper him in his business, racial bias and prejudice, no matter what the world threw him, he didn't let it stop him. He could see further and dream more lofty dreams than many people ever had ever met at that time. He was a man unfettered, unlimited. Uh, he would talk about things that people would merely dream about. Reginald Lewis made history in 1987 when he bought Beatrice International, a billion dollar food company that spanned the globe. I recall uh, vividly about four o'clock in the morning looking at the brochure describing the 64 companies in 31 countries saying that no one in his right mind would take on that task, particularly as we were coming off a very major success, uh, not more really than a few weeks earlier. The leveraged buyout Lewis crafted made headlines. It was his tenacity that closed the almost $1 billion deal with only $15 million of his own money on the line. We uh, went to Michael Milken. We said that Drexel would never have to actually fund a billion dollars. Uh, but they still promised to do it anyway. But I said that you'd never have to do that. So effectively, it was self-financed by about $450 million. So many people who want to achieve something try to achieve it by asking for favors or something. Reg never wanted a favor. He was tenacious. He was a visionary. And had Lewis lived, the complexion within the halls of power in the movie industry would have changed. In the last years of his life, he came to visit me and we talked about buying Paramount Studios. Why I felt he had an opportunity to buy Paramount. And I actually believe today, had his life not been cut short, he would have purchased Paramount. I think that the most important thing to remember is that most endeavors that are truly worth something will often have a very high failure rate associated with it. I think the trick is to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep going. He had a lot of things that he had to overcome. But that's why he loved that poem by Likes and Hughes, don't sit down and cry. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it, and splinters, and boards torn up. But all of the time, I have been a climbing on, and reaching landings, and turning corners. And sometimes in the dark, where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you set down on the steps, because you find it's kind of hard. For I still going, honey. I still climb it. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. You just got to keep on climbing. 
I always say you put your spikes in your shoes. And when you dig in that mountain, ain't nobody gonna knock you down, child. You just keep on climbing and you just keep on going, no matter what. And that's what happened. Stay with us to hear how Reginald Lewis was able to keep going no matter what. He was very much larger than life. He's the defining figure of my childhood, I think. I remember, and what I remember is him coming home, you know, wearing his business suit, and uh, he would always expect a hug. And so whenever he came home, I'd run downstairs and you know, make sure, drop whatever I was doing, and make sure you know, he got a big hug. He will put on his stereo, and then you see him start to get into like dancing sometimes by himself, which you know, I was shocked like seeing those kind of things. That you didn't know this man of this would have had that kind of uh, rhythm in him to be that more like down to earth. The first thing that jumped out when you met Reg, he was just a very, very smart guy. He was terribly, terribly focused. He knew what he wanted, he knew what he had to do to get what he wanted. Reg led the way. Reg opened the door and cleared the glass ceiling for all of us. He made us all believe that we can do anything. I remember his famous quote, keep going no matter what. Keep, keep going, going no, matter, no what. matter what and keep going. I know that uh, when, uh, when we're confronted with a challenge or working against superior resources or superior odds, I frequently uh, wonder whether what we're doing is, uh, is worth the, the effort. And somehow I remember all of the people who went before who had even greater odds. And somehow remembering that makes it very easy. Because a little something happens inside that says it's important, keep going no matter what. It's a soundbite for Lewis's life. He lived the courage of his convictions. I think there's an abundance of talent in America. Uh, perhaps our most underutilized pool of talent is in the inner cities and in some of our rural uh, communities. And I think America is at a place now where we simply can't afford to not develop all of our human resources. He was born December 7th, 1942 in East Baltimore, Maryland. He describes a segregated neighborhood in his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? The street was more a collection of rough rocks and pebbles than anything else. 1022 North Dallas Street, the heart of the ghetto of East Baltimore is the street where all my dreams got started. <laughs> is this Kappa hat? Lewis spent his college years at Virginia State University. He went on an athletic scholarship, and he, he, it didn't work well, and he, he got hurt or, or what have you. And uh, he said, Mama, I'm going to let it go, and I'll just work my way through. So I said to him, now, Reginald, you have to trust in the Lord. You have to trust in Reginald and you have to trust in, in me. But it was years before college that Reginald Lewis learned to trust his mother. Still, their relationship wasn't always an easy one. She says, he had a strong will and so did I. We had a little incident at home and he got a little upset with me because I put down some tough rules. And he said he was gonna leave and he was packing his bag. I said, if you go to your father's house, God knows where you're gonna sleep. So the only place I see for you is Baltimore City Jail. And what happens when they close the doors? That means you don't go anywhere. I said, now, what we have to do with each other is find out who you are. Are you mama's baby? Are you mama's little boy? Are you mama's little man? Who are you? Now, if you let me know, then I'll know what to do. In a moment, you'll learn what motivated Lewis's drive to succeed. When he was young, his mother left his father when he was three years old. And when he was around seven, he asked one of the members of the family, why did she do that? And somebody told him, because your father was not ambitious enough. And he, in his mind, he said, well, I'll be sure when I get married, she will never leave me because I'm not ambitious enough. 
At 10, Lewis's ambition was clear, but the head butting with mom over his paper route convinced Lewis he had to study law to do business. Reginald went to camp for two weeks, and uh, I served the papers. I put Jean in the stroller, and I put the papers under the stroller, and uh, I served, served his papers. And uh, when he came home from camp, he asked to settle up. And I said, well, what are we to settle up? He said, my money. I said, but I did the work, so I earned the money. He said, I'm going to get a lawyer. I said, you really need one because we didn't make a contract. I said, you don't do any business unless you have understanding. Studying law at Harvard University was the best way to effect that. So before he even applied, Reginald Lewis was admitted to Harvard Law School. His brilliance was clear, but shone brightest during mock trials. Professor Frank Sander helped open the elite doors of the Ivy League to Lewis. He was just very articulate and had immense energy and vivacity and uh, zest and poured himself into this uh, with great enthusiasm. Just four years out of law school, Lewis had one of the nation's most outspoken activists as a client. Sure. This is Reginald when Ben Shavers was with the mm -hmm. Wilmington 11. Mm -hmm. We didn't know anything about this trip to North Carolina until after it was over. Reginald Lewis was hired by the United Church of Christ in 1972 to defend activists in Wilmington, North Carolina. They were facing imprisonment and racist violence from the Klan. The group, the Wilmington 10, was led by Reverend Ben Shavers, who recounts the story at Lewis's funeral. Never saw so many law enforcement people carrying guns, really waiting out there on the tarmac when the plane let down. So when the plane landed, everybody rushed off the plane, including the pilots and the flight attendants, <laughs> and left Reggie and I on the plane. We said a prayer, and he said, I'm your lawyer. I will go first. You know what Mr. Lewis did? As we got down the ground, the sheriff was reaching for me. Mr. Lewis stood in the way and said, oh, no, let me see your identification. I was able to negotiate with the attorney general of the state of North Carolina to allow the church to post the bond with uh, interest-bearing securities as opposed to putting up a pure cash bond. And the, the, interest, uh, the interest earned from the, uh, from the uh, securities actually paid for the litigation for a year. So uh, I was pretty proud of that, and so was the church. And so was Harvard. The prestigious law school embraced one of her favorite sons, and his affection for his alma mater was equal. In 1992, he donated $3 million to Harvard Law School, more than the university had ever received from any one person in its almost 200-year history. I support the Harvard Law School because I think it's the best uh, law school uh, in the country. Uh, the Harvard Law School trains many of our leaders. I enjoyed uh, my years here and uh, feel that it's one of the many organizations that I would like to continue to support. In 1993, almost three months to the day he died, the Reginald F. Lewis International Law Center was dedicated. It is the first building on the Harvard campus named in honor of an African American. A fellowship in Lewis's name was later established to increase diversity within legal academia. I think the Reginald Lewis Fellowship has opened up law to someone like me, um, not only an African American lawyer, but I'm a legal historian, and um, I think that myself holding the, the fellowship is very consistent with uh, his legacy. The Lewis legacy brims with unique people. But there was one woman, a gifted young lawyer from the Philippines, whose special qualities wooed him into a marriage that lasted a lifetime. I knew that he was, you know, a step above me, a head above me. He was more ambitious. He was more intelligent. He knew how to make money. And, uh, and so, you know, and all the things that I thought i will never find all together in one person, I found in him. Lloyda Nicholas Lewis, now one of the wealthiest women in the world, runs TLC Beatrice. 
She met Reginald just after graduating from the University of the Philippines College of Law, the Harvard of the Philippines. Within six months, Loida and Reginald were married. I thought that since I'm so strong, I didn't want to get married and handpack my husband. So I was going to be, you know, a single woman going to politics, you know, be a senator all the way. And then when I met uh, Mr. Lewis, he was just different from all of them. Loida stayed home to raise their two daughters, Leslie and Christina. Mom's secret is a tremendous amount of self-confidence and, uh, you know, and a, just a real inner sense of self-worth. You know, like Dad, um, as she might have mentioned, had demons to battle. And Mom you know, doesn't have a lot of demons. And so she was, uh, you know, she was able to, you know, to be there and just to rely on her own um, inner strength and not to take things personally. She's really amazing. More with Reginald Lewis in a moment. He was a very strict man, and when he says something, he don't like nobody to change it. The first five years were tough. I knew that we were very in sync, but whether can I live with this man who is so intense and so uh, hard? Yes, he is. So I said, gosh, I you know. And good enough, I have a very close relationship with his mother, Carolyn Fugit. So I called her, mom, you know, your son is just so hard to live with. You know, I'm thinking maybe I should leave. And she said, I told Loida, no. when a person's upset, you don't bargain. There's no bargaining tools. You just listen. So for 24 years until the day he died, Loida was both tender and strong enough for her husband. Both of us are strong characters, but when he would get angry and I would get angry, he would, you know, let out all the words and I would just keep quiet, okay? In my heart, I will not. I will answer him in my mind, but I will not answer. And so, in fact, he said, what is this aggressive silence? Even though he get attitude sometimes, like when he get mad at you, it had a part about him where he always could apologize to you. I mean, a lot of people don't, they never, I have never heard nobody say that about him. Mr. Lewis, although he is very determined, very sure of himself, always there is a doubt. Always there is a, a uh, what do you call it now, second guessing. So all you should do is support him and say, yes, what you said was perfect, right on target. You know, so always support your man. It's hard enough. He's African-American, he's a black man in America. It's hard enough in this society. He often said that to be held responsible for that which you had no control over was dumb. That racism denied people the ability to think. That to be held, to be held accountable for that which you had absolutely no control, no contributions to, no, nothing to do with, and instead of looking at people about what they can accomplish, but putting those accomplishments on who they are under the prism of the race was done. On January 19, 1993, after six short months battling a brain tumor, Reginald Francis Lewis, a noted businessman, family man, scholar, and athlete, died. New Year's Eve and dinner he had here with his family. I saw him pray, which is a thing I never used to see him do. It always his wife or his daughter, or maybe his mother, would have said grace to those things. And it was funny to me to see him said, I will trade my riches for my health right now. So, even the most insurmountable obstacle, death, won't stop him. Though fate threw early death his way, his life was as full as that of someone who lived twice his age. That's what made him great. In 1993, we did send off a great man. But because of his robust pursuit of life, Reginald Francis Lewis left more than just memories. He left optimism, opportunity, and to those who loved him, the will and passion to keep going no matter what. I hope you've enjoyed this brief journey as we glimpse the provocative tales, incredible accomplishments, and the undeniable fortitude of a people 
as they travel from slave ships to spaceships. On behalf of RJR Communications, New Millennium Studios, and me, your host, Tim Reed, I want to thank you for watching, and I hope that you'll tune in to future installments of an American Legacy television special. History will never be the same.